I've made a decision, I'm not going to have a family, and that has meant I've been able to put a lot more into my music and my career. Every time you make a decision, you make a choice in life, you're effectively closing off other options. And life is short and you can't do everything. You can't do everything. You know, you have to make decisions. And the very process of making a decision is also a sacrifice. If you make a decision, I'm going to be a musician, you've sacrificed all of these other options that could have been available to you. And that happens every day of our lives. Every time we make a decision, we are effectively making compromises and sacrifices too. I'm very prolific. I make a lot of records. I make a lot of music. The reason is I have a lot of time to make music <laughs> because I don't have I don't have a family and I don't have kids. So that in itself is a decision, and in, in itself that has been a sacrifice, you know, to not do this and do this instead. Some some people would look at me with incredible pity, you know, and some people do say you've never had kids, and they look at me with pity. I said no, don't pity me because I feel good yeah. about. I'm happy. I think I made the right choice for me. Not everyone is meant to do, you know, to have the to go to the kids. I think I made the right choice and I'm very happy with my life and my career. I think one of the problems with being a touring musician yourself is that when someone invites you to a show, it's kind of the last thing you want to do. It's like someone saying to you, someone that works in an office all week, it's like someone saying to you on a Saturday night, hey, do you want to go and hang out in the office? Uh, I don't, as a rule, go to live shows. I don't really enjoy the experience of live shows. But that's not to say that I don't appreciate great live music. Of course I do, and I'm very committed to the idea of live music. But for me, to go to a live show, it has to be something extraordinary. I would go and see Prince, uh, or, you know, or I would go and see a friend's band, you know, if, if there was some like, you know, personal interest. But I'm not scanning... I'm not scanning the listings to see who's playing live. Who's playing where and going out. Because to be honest, it's, it's tough for me to, to enjoy that, that whole kind of experience. Is it difficult because of the way crowds are sort of now at live music, or is it because you're hypercritical as a musician? All of the above. Just, just the whole idea of going to a, 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 you know, a venue, hanging out in a dark room, uh, you know, with the smell of beer, and sweat and the volume and everything. I, you know, I'm kind of a little bit claustrophobic anyway. I don't like to be in, in crowds. I love to be up on stage, but sometimes I don't envy looking down. I don't envy <laughs> the people sort of crushed up. That's not my idea of fun. I would say it's because I'm old, but actually I never, I was like that when I was young too. I didn't really enjoy that kind of, you know, the claustrophobic atmosphere of being in a crowd uh, at, a, at a show or a festival. <laughs> Most recently for me, I was at Desert Trip, and it was during the Roger Waters set, mm -hmm. and people were looking at this set through their cameras, right. and I was almost, I felt bad for them, because yeah. here was the most amazing... And they'd probably spent hundreds and hundreds of dollars getting the ticket, getting there, booking the hotel... Hundreds, nothing, thousands. Thousands of yeah. dollars, and, and yet they're going to see the whole thing through it, which they could have just watched on YouTube anyway. They could have. It was the greatest stage and sound spectacle I've ever seen in my life. Oh, sure, yeah. And people were experiencing it through a little three-inch screen, and I just couldn't believe it. I said, what are these people doing? It's the world we live in. But then we, you know, but then we, that's, again, that's symptomatic of the world we live in. We have people who are listening to these extraordinary, you know, sonic, sonically beautifully created albums through MP3s, on little, you know, headphones when they're in the gym, when they're on the bus, there's all this ambient noise. Same thing, people watching movies on their cell phone, you know, be movies that have been shot on 32 millimeter film and, you know, stunning visuals and they watch it on a, on a, on a or at the back of a, an airport, you know, a, a plane seat, you know. That's the world we live in, isn't it? How do you consume music when you're at home? Are you vinyl? Are you... CDs? I mean, you said them. you don't like MP3. All of them. I don't listen to MP3s, but I listen to, you know, I listen to uh, music certainly on vinyl. I listen to music on CD. I, I'm, I'm an apologist for CDs. I think CDs get a bad rap now. You know, a lot of people say, CDs are so, you know, low resolution. Hey, they're not low resolution at all. They sound great. If they're mastered well, they sound great. And they're right at the top end of what the human ear can hear anyway. There's a lot of phony stuff spoken about vinyl and high resolution audio. I don't, don't buy a lot of it. But I love the whole tactile experience of vinyl. I love the kind of romantic you know, thing about taking the record out, putting it on the turntable. There's something beautifully magical and romantic and organic about that. And having the artwork in that kind of size and that and being able to feel 
feel the art and hold it in your hands. That's something you don't get from CD and you certainly don't get it from streaming. There's a lot of people like myself who think a lot about the album as a, as a kind of as a kind of continuum as a narrative flow. Not everyone does, you know. Some people just throw ten songs on a, on an album. It doesn't matter. But you, you know, you mentioned Roger Waters. There's a great example of sure. someone who, you know, a lot of what makes their work so special is the way that the music is almost analogous to cinema or to a novel. Uh, you're being told a story, and if you just have that playlist kind of mentality, you're not going to get that. You know? Absolutely not. I can't imagine people listening to Quadrophenia or Dark Side of the Moon or, you know, Sergeant Pepper without having the whole kind of concept of the flow and the narrative and the sequencing to me. But then I grew up, you know, I grew up in an age when albums were still, you know, I guess there's kids now being born into the world that that, that whole concept is kind sure. of alien to them. They're not interested in that. <laughs> Listen, it's not one of my favourite albums, but here's the thing. It was the first album I ever heard when I was a young kid, or at least it was the first time I was ever aware of here. Not the only one. It was that one and, and a Donna Summer record that, that my, my mum used to play a lot uh, called Love to Love You Baby with Giorgio Moroder production. Amazing record also. And I, it, those two records were the first two records I was aware, I was conscious of hearing. And I was conscious of hearing what we were talking about, the idea of the album as a kind of continuum. I don't listen to that. I mean, I haven't listened to Dark Side of the Moon for many years. I almost don't need to, you know? It's right. almost in my DNA. It's almost part of my DNA. I don't need to ever hear it again, you know? Uh, so in that sense, it's important to me. Uh, I wouldn't say it's one of my favorite albums, but I will defend it uh, to the ends of the earth as one of the, one of the most beautifully realized uh, and perfect rock albums ever made, for sure. I'm not sure if I'm a good Pink Floyd fan or a bad Pink Floyd fan. My favorite album is Animals, and I can't get into Sid Barrett era Pink Floyd. Okay. I, I love Sid Barrett. I mean, the first Floyd album, Piper It Gets Done For Me, is one of their masterpieces, no doubt. But, you know, I think that's one of the beauties. This is interesting, just leaving aside the specific band for a moment, the idea that you can follow a band across their career and actually track the development their own their evil i mean the evolution the, between the two albums you've just mentioned for example say piper gets dawn the evolution is phenomenal right it's only 10 years it takes tool more than 10 years to make one album now <laughs> you know and i'm not picking on tool but it's just a kind of easy target but there's a band that, that kind of you look at the development of the beatles between 1963 and 1970 it's extraordinary i mean the beatles basically formed changed history, rewrote the whole you know, book, created the blueprint for a lot of what we now think of as modern pop and rock music, and broke up within the space of time that it takes some bands now to make one album. Right. And, and that to me is mind blowing and is again symptomatic of how things have changed. I think there was such an appetite for creating and there was such a sense of people being encouraged to experiment, to evolve, to confront the expectations of their audience. Since the 21st century, I think the music, the archetypal music listener has become more conservative. The way they engage with music is, is more uh, convenient. So we listen to MP3s, we listen to playlists in the gym, on the bus. We don't want anything that's gonna blow our minds too much. We just want something that's kind of nice in the background while we check our emails, text our buddies, check the news, whatever it is. And that's unfortunate. Um, I think for musicians like myself who kind of almost feel like we've been born into the wrong era. There's too much music in the world and I think that because music is so ubiquitous now and there's probably too much of it that I think uh, we've become a little bit more blasé about the way we you know I mean again going back to those era of bands like the Beatles a new album by the Beatles was such an event everyone knew there was a new Beatles album coming out even going into, you know, when I was growing up, I remember it being a real, you know, a fantastic event when, you know, a band like Tears for Fears would release a new album. And then Nirvana in the 90s, you know, big event records, Guns N' Roses, you know. Uh, do we have those anymore, those kind of big event albums? I don't think so. I can't, I was, as you were saying that, I was trying to remember what the last album that I was sitting there with bated breath going, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. 
I think the part of the problem is that now the kind of the whole the whole con the old the whole kind of idea of a release date is so diffuse, isn't it? Because sure. the the album is streamed like two weeks before it comes out, and then it comes out in the shops. It's almost like an anti climax. Plus, somebody's probably already stolen it from the studio and released it on. Whatever and, site. And, you know, and as an artist, you almost have to embrace that and accept that and say, okay, my album's going to be stolen anyway, so I may as well release it to the public. For a long time, I kind of resisted having my music on streaming. Spotify. Stuff. And Spotify and, yeah. and Deezer and Tidal. And in the end, you just think, well, I'm just hurting myself here. Yeah, who's losing here? Because the people that, are, that go on streaming services and can't find Stephen Wilson music, they're not going to go and buy the CD. They're just going to say, I'll sod it, I'll listen to something else, you know, because there's millions of other albums. So at the end of the day, I'm thinking, well, I'm only kind of really hurting myself here by not having my music available to these people. So you kind of, you have to adopt, almost adopt this kind of siege mentality that if you can't beat them, join them. It's a war. It's a war to, to fight, to build Still fun. audience. It's fun and it's frustrating because I've never had any, <laughs> any mainstream, I've never had any support from the mainstream. I've never been on the radio, I've never been on TV, you won't hear my songs in movies, you won't hear my, you, you know, you won't read about me in, I mean, with some exceptions, but I'm, I'm talking, talking generally now. And I could be very frustrated about that, and I am frustrated about that, but I don't let it, I don't let it lose, I don't let myself lose sleep over it anymore. I accept it, partly because of the kind of music that I'm perceived to play, which again, I have another issue with that, that whole kind of generic classification, but because of the kind of music I'm perceived to play, uh, it, it's very hard to get that kind of mainstream coverage. But that's interesting to hear because I hear it and I don't, you know, I just think, okay, well, do I like the music? Do I not like it? I don't right. really think about how bands are classified. And most people don't. And they but, have to, in iTunes, I guess, put you somewhere. And most, you know? people, and most people don't, but the people that do are the radio programmers, the TV programmers, the people who make movies and program music. They're the people that, that, that care about those things. Do they still have clout? They certainly do. They certainly mm. do. Nowadays, of course, the people that have the biggest, the most clout are the people who put the playlist together on Spotify. Right. That's uh, playlisting now on Spotify is so influential. And again, you're gonna if you'll see playlists on Spotify, nine out of ten times you're gonna see all the hip names, these the Radioheads, the Arcade right. Fires, the Boniverse. And I love all those artists. Don't get me wrong, but I've never been part of that hipster clique, partly because of where I'm perceived to have come from. Those artists have come from the indie alternative sort of direction. I've come from the complete opposite direction. I grew up listening to bands like Iron Maiden. The thing is a lot of people talk about the music business as if it's one thing, as if X Factor is in the same business that I'm in. And it's not really, you know, X Factor and, and, and these, these shows, The Voice, that is the extreme of what I would call the entertainment industry. And the entertainment industry really has very little to do with the arts. And people, t you know, sometimes my mum, my mum and her friends will say to me, you know, why, you know, all these kids on X Factor, why aren't you on TV? I said, that's a completely different industry, mum. That's the entertainment industry. I'm in the music industry. It's not, although they're, it's, on the surface, they're playing music, they're not really, they're not really making music. They're not making music. It's not music. No, it's fodder. It's, it's part of the entertainment industry. It's fine, I have no problem with it, but it's not the industry I'm in. I'm in the music industry. For me, making art is a very selfish, it's one of those paradoxes that it's incredibly selfish. It should be when it's done properly. It should be incredibly selfish, incredibly narcissistic, and done just really to please the person that makes it. But then there's this kind of paradox, that, which is that when you've finished it, you want to share it with as many people as possible and you want to see yourself reflected back in the mirror of an audience. Yeah, I mean, there's something about validation that an artist, you do it for yourself, but at the end of the day, you're like, all right, well, someone has to look at this. It's If a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, to well, make you know, the sound. But there are, people, <laughs> there are people out there that do just do it for themselves and they don't have that urge. I mean, I know that yeah. I have some friends, they make amazing music, they never release it. They play it to me, say, oh, I've done this song. It's amazing, you should release it. What for? Some people just do it for love for themselves. And, and um, I'm not one of those people. I have an ego. I do have an ego. And having an ego is not in a negative, it's a good thing sometimes, you know. This guy had a massive ego. Sure. And that's what made him the greatest pop star of all time for me. There's too much music in the world.